you for your word of exhortation. It is a word that talks to us about how we are to live according to your holy word. It is a direction from your Holy Spirit to us how to walk in the Spirit and thus cause many to see the good works you have done in us and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Bless this message to each one of us in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. God's purpose for every one of his children is that we surrender. We surrender to the reign and rulership of the Holy Spirit. God does not want certain individuals to surrender to the Spirit, but he wants everyone that has received Christ as their Savior to surrender their thoughts, their attitudes, their directions, their life to the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, if he lives in you, let him direct you. Many of us do things without asking the Holy Spirit to direct us. We simply do it because it needs to be done, but we don't know how we should do it or when we should do it. And if we don't know that, we make a mess of things. The Holy Spirit has told us if we will not lean to our own understanding, but will listen to him, we'll consider him. How do you consider him? Well, by the end of this message, I hope you will know. But it's simply asking God to give you direction. Whatever you're doing, whatever decision you're making, you must ask God Show me what you want me to do in that situation or that circumstance. Show me what you want me to say to anyone that comes before me. In this message, then, I want to show you two things. The first, what it means to walk in the Spirit. What it means to walk in the Spirit. Not just live a Christian life but actually knowing at the end of the day you've done what the Holy Spirit would have directed you to do. Secondly, how you can obtain such a walk. The Word of God doesn't tell us you must walk in the Spirit and then not tell us how to walk in the Spirit or what are the symptoms, the characteristics of a person who is walking in the Spirit. I believe Acts 16 is one of the best examples of what it means to walk in the Spirit. But what does it mean to you? Please note on the screen the first one. Number one, walking, this, walking the Spirit in the Spirit means incredible detailed direction and unclouded decisions. Let me say that again. When you're walking in the Spirit, it means that you receive incredible, detailed directions and an unclouded decision. In other words, you know exactly what you are to do. When I get ready to preach a message, I ask God at the beginning of the week, what do you want me to preach on? If he doesn't give me any direction, I'll be making several messages and tossing them away because they won't be the one God wants. So I must ask God in particular, what do you want me to preach on this next Sunday? And invariably, God tells me what he wants me to preach on, and he brings together the message because I have asked him to give me direction. And God never gives us direction without us asking him for that direction. The Holy Spirit provides then absolute, now notice this, this is for every believer in Christ, absolute clearly detailed 
instructions to those who walk in him. You're to go here, you're to go there. And by the way, God says go here, but he doesn't always tell you what you're going to do when you get there until you get there. Remember what the Holy Spirit did with Abraham when he said, I want you to leave your country, and I want you to head in that direction. Well, where am I heading to? God didn't say. When you get there, I'll tell you the next step. I've seen these mysteries that are on TV at times, and sometimes the individual is told, go to this street on, and listen for a call at this time on the phone. Of course, phone booths are out of the picture nowadays, but it used to be that they'd go to the phone booth, and then someone would call at that time and tell them where else to go, and then they would go to that direction, and then they would hear another direction of where to go, and finally they would end up in the destination but it was around the corner several different times. That's how God works with the child of God. I'll tell you where to go, but I'm not going to tell you until you get there what to do. And we want to know all the information at once. We want to know when I get there, I'm going to do this. Yes, you told me I'm going to do this, and it's going to, it's going to be a good reaction, not a bad reaction. God just doesn't tell us that. He tells us sometimes, I want you to do this, and I'm not going to tell you till you get there that you're going to have a hard time there. How many times did he direct the apostles? He said, I want you to go to this place, and... I'll tell you what's going to happen there when you get there. And it was not always easy to take. All right, now notice number two on the screen. If you walk in the Spirit, then you don't walk in confusion. Your decisions, again, aren't clouded ones. If you walk in the Spirit, you do not walk in confusion. If you're in confusion, then you're not walking in the Spirit. God will precisely tell me the first step. Then he'll tell me the second step. It's like my life as a pastor. I started in a church in Wolfboro Falls, and uh, he said, you're going there. And he provided a job for my wife in a school system in that area. And everything seemed to be wonderful. He didn't tell me what would happen seven years later. And it was not an easy situation by any means. The reality of God told me to go and lead the young people's group on the street and witness for Christ. That ushered me out of that church very quickly. They were embarrassed. God didn't tell me that would happen. Why? Because I, as a young pastor, I probably would have been shy to walk that way and do that thing. He waited until I had done it, and then he moved me on to the Greater Grace Ministry, which has been tremendous in my life. And yet he didn't tell me the trials and tribulations I would have as a teacher in the greater grace ministries. He just said, that's your next step. You are to minister. And God gave me a lot of students to declare the word of God to in a great time as well as trou troubles and tribulations. And then he led us to this church Oh, I thought, boy, this church is going to flower like it's never flowered before. I had some very, very good people in this church, and God did a great work over the years, but he never told me that we'd never increase in numbers. He never told me that. It was another step of faith. Are you faithful in that? 
He led us into a ministry here of ministering to youth until one of our youth directors got in trouble with the law and it decimated our youth uh, outreach. God finally led us on the internet. He did not tell me that there would be troubles at times on the internet. It wouldn't be just with the internet, but it would be with the equipment that put us on the internet. He didn't tell me I'd have to learn the computer because you see, as a young person, as a uh, young pastor, we knew nothing about the computer in that those days. It's like we had a, a, a many partied phone system when I was there, black and white TV where the, the biggest shows were the snow shows. In other words, it didn't come in that well with an antenna. He never told me that I'd get into a worldwide ministry because, you see, he wanted me to follow him each step of the way. And if you can't see yourself in that ministry, in that lifestyle, then it's strange because everything you've gone through, God didn't tell you you'd go through before you went through it. And yet he said, I'll be there and I'll be your sufficiency. I'll be the one that never leaves you nor forsakes you. Many people can forsake you, but God has promised to be faithful. So all of the leading of the Spirit was without knowing where it would end, where it would start again, what would happen, why the troubles that would be my portion as well as the victories. He never, never told me more than I needed to know to stay true to him. And by the grace of God, we have done that. Note number three on the screen, if you will. The early Christians did not walk in confusion either. They were led by the Spirit in every decision and action. The ministry will begin early church in Jerusalem. You will be so content to stay in Jerusalem even though there will be all kinds of terrible trials that I will allow it to come to a point where you'll be scattered into all the world. And that's not where you wanted to go. But I will reach the world for Jesus Christ through you, disciples. The church's motto throughout the New Testament was this. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. The reality is, friends, we've got to have a good hearing ear to the Holy Spirit of God. We've got to shut out the world because the world is saying, do this, do that, do it this way, do it that way. And we've got to shut that out of our thinking and hearing and saying, what does God tell me I am to do? How does God tell me I am to live? We are to be led not by emotions or by other people. We are to be led by the Spirit of God. Philip and Peter walked in the Spirit. We're told in the Word of God. And they got very detailed, incredible directions. God was using Philip powerfully, and we read that in the Word of God, in Samaria. People were being saved by the scores. People were being baptized. They were being delivered from all kinds of demonic activity. Yes, demons are real. There was a, a, a real victory going on in Samaria under Philip, uh, Philip's uh, teaching. A revival. And all of a sudden, God's Holy Spirit directs Peter to go to the desert. You're having a very successful campaign. People are being saved. And all of a sudden, God's Spirit says, I want you to go to the desert 
there's one person there I want you to minister to. So the Spirit of God directed Philip to go to the desert of Gaza. In obedience, Philip packed in everything, not knowing why, not having any direction other than there would be a man he would be teaching, but all those people that he had been leading a evangelistic campaign for would have to wait because God had one person in need. So he packed everything and he said goodbye to those in Samaria and he came as he went to the desert of Gaza. Gaza. He met a Ethiopian, <coughs> Ethiopian eunuch, <coughs> if I can get that out. An Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this man had been reading the word of God from the book of Isaiah. And he had no one to interpret it for him. And he wanted to know what it was talking about. In Isaiah 8, verses 29 to 30, the word of God reads this. The spirit to told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Are you going to obey me, Philip? And Philip obeyed God. He goes on to say, Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. Do you understand, he said to this man, what you are reading? Do you understand it? Too many people hear the word of God, but they don't understand the word of God. And they need for somebody led of the Holy Spirit of God to tell them what the Bible is saying, what it is declaring. And if you're the one there, God has chosen you to give them understanding of that passage. So the word of God makes it very clear. Philip started opening the meaning to the message of Isaiah 53. And he revealed Christ to this man. Can you understand? Here is a revival in Samaria. Many are being saved. But God says there's one in the desert I want you to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's ready. He comes from Ethiopia. He can spread the gospel in Ethiopia but he needs to know the gospel. And Philip immediately obeys God, not knowing who this person was, what he was reading, but he knew that God was sending him to that desert. And the next thing Philip knew, the man received Christ and said, what hinders me to be baptized? Now, you wouldn't think there'd be much water in the desert, but they found an oasis and they baptized this man. Baptism is very essential to obedience to the word of God. It does not save you. It is a sign that you were saved and you're declaring it openly. And so this Ethiopian said, I want to be baptized. I want to so identify with Jesus Christ that wherever I go, I can tell him I identified openly with Jesus through water baptism. Do you understand? He wholeheartedly gave his life to Christ. He was just as important to God as were the many that were receiving Christ in Samaria just as important. Don't ever think that the one is less important than the many. Jesus went to the ones and the he went to me, he went to my folks. He went he went to each one of us and taught us the word of God. He went to my wife. Each person was important to God. You're important to God. Don't ever think that God would not have sent his son to die on the cross 
if you'd been the only one that was lost. God values each person. God values each person. Then Acts 8.39 comes into view. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. He had obeyed God. He'd done God's will, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way, the eunuch, rejoicing. He was translated to another place. The Bible doesn't tell us right off where that other place was, but he was in one place, and then all of a sudden he was in another place. When you see Christ, you're going to have that experience. You'll be down here, and the rapture will take place, and all of a sudden you will be in the clouds. Before you know it, in the twinkling of an eye, you will be in the presence of Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. My God is a mighty God, and he can take an individual from one place and put him in another place in no time at all. Many believe, and it's only a projection of what could have happened. They believe that Jesus Christ, during the time of the resurrection and the ascension, when he could not be seen constantly, went into all the world and made himself clearly the Messiah and announced the reality of it. Indians have, American Indians, have a certain understanding of the Great Spirit that is very, very interesting regarding the presence of the Spirit appearing to them. And who can say it was not Jesus during that time declaring his victory over the forces of darkness? Only God knows, but I can tell you this. Philip was ready to do whatever God led him to do, and he did it. Now let's turn our attention to Peter. He was on the rooftop when the Spirit directed him praying, and he got a vision from God. You know, the best times in life are the times when you're talking with God. And Satan tries to keep you from talking with him. He will disrupt situations so that you uh, don't continue your thoughts about talking with God, but something interferes with it, and you're drawn aside from it, and you must guard your times when you talk with God. You must do everything possible not to let any interference come when you're having a talk with God. It is quality time. It is very important time for those times are the times that God is receiving and giving to you. Every Wednesday in our midweek service, we have a time of prayer. And God speaks, and God listens, and God responds, and God heals, and God cares and encourages there is no, no church that can survive without a time of prayer that the people of God enter into. It is a time when God gives you the power and the encouragement to go on like never before. So it is in your own private life. It is a time when you come before God and say, Oh God, I need your mind on this decision. I need encouragement because I'm discouraged today. I need you to have someone call me up and tell me I mean something to them. Do you understand that God will lead each one to edify different ones in the body of Christ? You may not know they need it, but if you edify them, Many of them will say to you, you don't know how I really needed that edification today. God showed me that 
many times when I have ministered over the phone that what I said that encouraged a person helped them to make it through. Linda was one of those. I had the opportunity to minister to her, and she said she slept the best she's ever slept. Tanya was another individual that I ministered to, and she ministered right back to me, and you don't know how that blessed me. We do not get led by the Spirit into something that is not productive, but the Spirit leads us, and it's always going to produce something that is needed. God is the God that gives us that direction. When God told me to go to college, Bible school, college, I was not the kind of a student that could go there and say, I have it made. I'm very intelligent. I was a average student that God told me to go there because I was going to be in preparation for the ministry. And in my particular church, it was seven years four in college, seven or three in divinity school. I said, but God, don't you understand? I'm not very bright. I was being honest with God. And yet, A's and B's all the way through. It was God. What God gave me to do, he gave me the capacity to do. What God gives you to do, he'll give you the capacity to do it. And you'll astound yourself because you know it's not you. It's God that's doing that through you. And it will make you lean on him even more. So here is Peter receiving a vision. In the vision, the Lord was teaching Peter, don't call anything unclean that I have said is clean. All kinds of unclean animals were in that vision. The Jews did not eat those kind of animals. And God was saying to him, what I call clean, you have no business in not calling clean. What was he saying? He's saying you won't go to the Gentiles because they're unclean. He wasn't telling them necessarily to eat those unclean animals. He was using them as an illustration that there is no one that you had better call unclean and not worthy of the gospel. The prostitutes are worthy to receive the gospel. The murderers, are they're, they're godly enough to receive the gospel because God put that vacuum in them. Let them hear the gospel and turn from their murderous ways. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for those that you hear of that are going down the wrong road. Pray for them. They're worthy as a creation of God to hear the gospel message. Peter I don't want you calling any person on this earth not worthy to hear the gospel. God isn't willing that any should perish, but that all would have that opportunity. As this was taking place, the vision was taking place, he was seeing this. Three men stood at Peter's gate, it says, and they said, is this Peter's house? They were sent by the Holy Spirit to his house for a reason. God knew what he was doing in Peter's life through this vision, and now he was going to send these men. And the Spirit said to Peter, go downstairs. He didn't even know they were down there. Go downstairs. Are we sensitive to the Spirit of God so that God can direct us and we won't say, well, I, I haven't got time to go down there. There have been people that have called me years ago, and I just didn't want to answer them because I knew that they were trouble. And God said, answer them. Answer them. 
And as I've told you before, sometimes it was I became the victim when I was not the victim. I was not guilty. But in order to restore, I took on the position of being the victim. Didn't Jesus do that for you and I? He became guilty. And we were the ones guilty, not Jesus. But he became the one that took the punishment. And it goes on to say in that passage of Acts 10, 19 to 22, when they had gone downstairs, there were three men standing at the gate. They're going to ask you, he t the Holy Spirit told him, to go with them. You are to go. Don't doubt anything. Just go. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to be practical. Just do what the Holy Spirit is directing you to do. It reminds me of that time when the Holy Spirit directed me to kiss that guy's fist who was going to let me have it because he didn't like us visiting his wife. It was very strange. And I'm very happy God hasn't directed me to do that again. But I can tell you this, it deactivated the anger. Follow the Holy Spirit's leading, even if it doesn't seem reasonable to you. These were absolutely clear, clear, detailed instructions to Peter Later in Jerusalem, Peter told the brethren why he had eaten with these Gentiles. They were rip-snotting mad. How could you eat with these Gentiles and give them the gospel? How could you have the Holy Spirit given to them as well? People will not understand the Holy Spirit if they're not living in the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit doesn't do things according to the way I do them. He does things according to the way he would do them. Acts eleven twelve, and the Spirit bade him go with them, nothing doubting. Peter said, the Spirit told me to do it. The Spirit told me to do it. Oh, of course. You know, when the Spirit tells you to do something, somebody doesn't believe it, they're going to have that attitude, oh, sure he did. Yeah, he really did. But they won't believe you. So he says, when the Holy Spirit told me to do it, I ate with them because the Holy Spirit spoke clearly to me. He would have been sinning against God if he knew God had directed him to do something and he chose not to do it. Number four on the screen. The early church never sent out workers or missionaries, my friends, unless the Holy Spirit chose and ordained them. Sometimes out of necessity, we choose workers or missionaries to go out from a local church unless the Holy Spirit clearly tells you to do that don't do it we've got a beautiful missionary couple that's in Indonesia right now and they have proved from their work in Brazil and their work in China and now their work in Indonesia they are servants of Jesus Christ and they are led of the Spirit, and so we help support them because God Almighty has shown that they're truly led of the Spirit of God. People that go on the mission field and never witness for Christ on the mission field are not led by God, and no one should support them that is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, but people that do serve God on the mission field, are constantly witnessing for Jesus Christ. This pastor who's on the mission field that was supporting his wife has Parkinson, but she doesn't want anyone to know so that she can serve God without anyone trying to stop her. 
That's the same thing with my wife. She has Parkinson, but she does not cease to serve Almighty God because she knows God gave her to this ministry and he gave her certain things to do and she's doing them and I give God the glory for a help me that does that. You see, the reality is this, friends. We must never do it because the emotions tell us to do it or somebody says you should do it. We should do it only because the Holy Spirit has strongly, strongly convicted us. This is the way. Walk ye in it. The church sent out these missionaries and these workers and ordained them only because God had shown them that this was the thing to do. Now listen to this in Acts 13, 2 to 4. I, I, it's either 13 or 3. Listen to it. As they ministered to the Lord and fast, fasted, the Holy Spirit said, they're ministering to the Lord and they're fasting, okay? So they're in the spirit to receive from God. So the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul. For the work unto which I have called them and when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them as missionaries. They sent them away, so they'd being sent forth by the Holy Spirit of God. They did it because the Holy Spirit directed them to do it. We're on the Internet because the Holy Spirit directed us to do it. We are surviving as a minister because the Holy Spirit told us to do it. Everything the Holy Spirit directs us to do, he takes care of, and he will always do that. Included in these incredible instructions to these men are precise warnings about what is coming. Now, you're going to be sent out, but there isn't going to be all hunky-dory. There's going to be trouble. Jesus isn't talking merely about prophecy that would happen and future events. He's talking about their lives. You're going, but it's going to be a rough road that you're going on. Are you going to go anyways? And they did. Number five. Walking in the Spirit is about being led by Him in every practical, uh, very practical daily living. Being led by Him in very practical daily living. The Spirit warned Paul that his trip to Jerusalem would result in his being taken prisoner. Are you going to go? Will you still go because I'm telling you what's going to happen when you get there? I ask myself, would I do the same thing if I knew if I went to a certain place? And it wasn't going to be easy, would I go? By the grace of God, I hope I would. How about the Elliot's? who was sent to go to the Elka Indians. And when they got there, they were killed before they ever established a ministry there. They went. They did not know what would be the result of their going, but they went anyway. And when they were slain, the wife, the wife of the one that was slain, she went knowing what could happen to her to complete her husband's calling. And souls have been saved ever since. Are people totally dedicated to the cause of Christ or are they dedicated to a point where it doesn't hurt? Tell me, 
is it all going to be good? If it isn't all going to be good, I don't want to follow Jesus. What's the difference? Well, this is what the Holy Spirit directed Paul when he told him to go to Jerusalem. Acts 21, verses 10 to 11. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, when you go there, will bind the owner of this belt, which was Paul, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. That was not good news. He's saying, look, Paul, this is the direction of the Holy Spirit of God. But I must tell you that when you get there, it's going to mean imprisonment. Or maybe I shouldn't go. Doesn't it sound like the disciples... When Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem, and they knew that he had been almost stoned to death when he was there not long ago. And if he went to Jerusalem, they tried to do that again. But Jesus did not come to do his own will, even though he had the will of the Father. He came clearly to do God's will. God directed him to go to Jerusalem. He knew that the time of Palm Sunday, would it would come into a crucifixion time. But he never faulted to obey the direction of God the Father. So Paul, he said, all right, we're going anyway. I know that this is going to happen to me but I'm here to do the will of God. He was really converted. Remember, he killed Christians before he was converted. He tortured Christians before he was converted. But when he was totally changed by the Holy Spirit of God, he said, not my will, but thine be done, and he paid the price. He ended up losing his life. For the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was willing to pay the price, are we? Are we willing to pay the price? I see a lot of Christians who whine a lot. I wondered if they wanted any bread with that wine. They whine. They whine about their aches and pains like God's mean to them. He doesn't take away all their aches and pains. If he took away all our aches and pains, do you think we'd want to leave and go home to be with Jesus? No. If we didn't have some pain that is bothering us, is hounding us, would we want this life to ever end? So God allows these things in our lives to show us mortality. Uh, it, mortality is not immortality as far as this body is concerned. We are desiring like all nature, it says, that we might be freed from this time of the curse. So it was that Paul was ready to give his life for Christ. Number six. Walking in the Spirit also means never being intimidated by demonic harassment. Never being intimidated by demonic harassment. If you walk in the Spirit, you will be constantly hounded and harassed by demonic powers. I've never had one moment since I got into the ministry that demonic powers have not harassed me. Why shouldn't they harass me? I'm walking according to the word of God, not according to the demons, the satanic horde. 
but you don't have to be destroyed by their attacks. Send your Savior to the door when they knock. When the thought comes in your mind, God doesn't love you, send scripture to the door and say, my God says he loves me with an everlasting love. I'm not going to believe this from you, Satan. Many times he has harassed me. The demons have harassed me in the pulpit. But God has always brought me through by the grace of God. He's harassed us in our income of the church and he's harassing us now in the church, having rot in it. Well, God knows how to deal with rot, whether it be human rot or physical rot. My God shall supply all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That is a need. And so is your income a need, and God knows that. God knows that. The demons may harass you, but God is greater than the demons of hell. Paul was continually, it says, harassed by demonic powers. He was preaching to a Sergius Paulus, an official, a deputy of the Isle of Patmos, when demons at attempted to interfere but the Spirit welled up inside of the Apostle Paul, and we read these words in Acts 13, verses 9 to 12. And then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked down at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of of everything that is right, you are full of all deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the ways of the Lord? He's talking to this man filled with demons. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. It says, immediately, mist and darkness came over Elymas, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by hand. He couldn't see anything. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed and was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. The demons attacked, but God was greater. God is greater than any, any demonic attack. Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, brought down the powers of light upon darkness. And in Acts 16, the devil again came against the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And again, Paul responded. Every time the demons came against him, Paul responded. Listen to Acts 16, verses 16 to 18. Once when we were going to a place of prayer, Paul said, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Demonic spirit. She earned a great deal of money from the owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. When the demons say that, it's trickery. They knew what she was like. And that testimony from her was not what Paul wanted. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed with her. Everywhere they'd go, she'd be shouting this, that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her demonics. At that moment, the Spirit left her. The demon left her. Do you understand God is saying, when you are serving 
God Almighty, the demons will come against you, but you have a greater God in you than are in this world. Note number seven. Walking in the Spirit means being worry-free no matter what happens to you. God will take care of it. God will take care of it. I have to remind myself of that. If you're in the Spirit, then God's going to tell you, I'll take care of that. Trust me. Trust me. When you take authority and command the devils to flee. We tried that this morning. I told the devil to go to hell. I can always tell the devil where to go. No person, but I can tell the devil to go there. It reminds him he is going there one day. And the Bible says we will cast him in along with God, casting him in. So he said, I command the devils to flee. Satan will came at you with everything in his arsenal, but he lost the battle. Just after Paul cast these devils out of this possessed woman, Satan started stirring up more trouble. Don't think that Satan isn't going to keep on stirring up trouble. Look what he did to Job. Don't worry about that. He's a loser. He will lose in the end. We will see his destruction. Number eight, if we are to walk in the Spirit, then we must believe God for the supernatural deliverance from every trial Satan gives us. Look over the years at the times God has delivered you and you thought it was hopeless. It is not. Walking in the spirit, number nine, means never again fearing man. Why? Because God will give you holy boldness. Holy boldness. How can you obtain such a walk in the spirit? Number one, it's not on there. You must go after this walk with everything in you. You must want it so desperately you're willing to give up anything that would interfere with you getting that kind of a walk. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you all you need, and he will do that. Number 10, focus on knowing and hearing the Spirit. Focus on hearing and knowing the Spirit, and get your eyes off your troubles and temptations. When I can't sleep, my eyes are on my troubles. Every time I have a doctor's appointment, I think it's going to be rotten, it's going to be hard, it's going to be awful. Well, I had a blood test and there's not much they can find that's awful. There's nothing. What I'm saying is Satan tries to put fear in us and if we're not careful, we'll center in on the fear and we've got to get our eyes off that and get our eyes back on Jesus Christ. Give him quality time. Listen to him. Don't make that something, I just don't have time to do it, Pastor. No, 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 we must do it because it's where our strength comes from. I thank God for all the times that God has directed me and all the times I've been sensible enough to follow it. I have never regretted following God the direction of the Holy Spirit. I have regretted not doing it quick enough, but I've never regretted it when I desperately said, oh God, I'll do that. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you and I praise you 
for the direction of the Holy Spirit. Help us to walk according to the Holy Spirit's leading and direction, Father. Help us to get our eyes off our troubles and put them on to God's solution, focusing on Jesus, who's the answer to all those situations, who can supply all we need according to his riches, who can cause us in the midst of tribulation to get our eyes off the tribulation and put them on to Jesus and be directed by Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, perhaps you've never received Christ as your Savior. You may be in any part of this world or you may be here, but you need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need to commit yourself to Jesus because everything is very messed up in your life. Trials and tribulations you have no answer for. You're walking down the wrong path and you know it. Why not walk down the path of Jesus Christ and be saved by the blood of Christ from a life that is ruined and an eternity that is looming ahead very quickly. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come in your life and forgive your sins and be your Savior, do that now. Don't just hear that. Act upon it. For that is very important. Dear Jesus, forgive my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Help me to walk according to the Word of God, according to the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray.